Hello Biology 100 students, welcome to your lecture on the senses. Now you've heard before that there's five different senses, right? Sight, smell, hearing, taste, and touch. Well in truth there's actually more senses than that. We have equilibrium, which is our ability to maintain balance. We also have something called proprioception, which is ability to know where our arms and legs are and where our joints are positioned, even though we might have our eyes closed. So there's many more senses than just the five you see here, but these are the five that we're going to concentrate on in this lecture. Okay, before we go on to talk about how the senses work, we need to go through some vocabulary. So first off, we have something called a stimulus. A stimulus is any type of sensory input. For example, that stimulus could be pressure, like pressing on your palm would be an example of a stimulus that would stimulate a mechanoreceptor. We could also have a chemical stimulus, like we get when we're breathing things in and we're smelling smells, or when we're tasting particular molecules that are in our food. So those are all stimuli. On the other hand, a receptor is a structure which is specialized to receive that stimuli and convert that stimuli into a pattern of electrical potentials. And that process is called transduction. So we have sensory receptors in our eyes, in our ears, in our skin, all over our body, really. So sensation is the actual becoming aware of a stimulus. When we actually stimulate you, it's actually gonna take a few milliseconds before that information travels up the nerves through the spinal cord, up through the thalamus of the brain, and eventually to the cortex. So for the most part, sensation occurs in the cortex. And finally, perception is analysis of that sensation. What does that sensation mean? Is it good? Is it bad? Etc. Okay, so we need to concentrate on one word here, which I think is very, very important, and this is transduction. Transduction is conversion of any of these stimuli into a pattern of electrical impulses. And that's important because even though our ears are designed to receive sound, uh, our brain only understands electrical impulses. It doesn't understand sound vibrations. So the ear's job is to take those sound waves and transduct them into a pattern of nerve impulses that the brain can understand. Okay, in order for sensation and perception to occur, several steps need to take place. First of all, we have stimulation, which you see on your left-hand side. The person is stimulating their finger using a little needle, and so we poke our finger using the needle, and we're stimulating the touch receptors or pain receptors that are in your fingertips. And these are modified sensory neurons. So you can see that neuron right here, and its dendrites or processes are in the end of your fingertip. If we stimulate that enough, that mechanical pressure will be transduced into a graded potential and then a pattern of actual action potentials which are transmitted along that sensory neuron. So again, transduction was conversion of that stimulus into a pattern of uh, nerve impulses. We eventually transmit those impulses to the spinal cord. We're still not aware of it yet, but what happens now is the spinal cord uh, does some integration and it also routes that information up to the thalamus of the brain and the thalamus of the brain is where we then route it to the appropriate part of the cortex where we become aware of the stimulus. Uh, so we're having sensation, but then we're actually perceiving what that sensation means. Oh, I'm poking myself with a needle. That kind of hurts. I shouldn't do that again. So that's the process of transduction, sensation, and perception. Okay, you've heard before about the general senses versus the special senses. Now, the big definition here is the general senses are senses that are distributed all throughout the body, such as pain, temperature, touch, pressure, etc. On the other hand, the special senses are cephalized. They're just found in the head, and this includes things like taste, smell, vision, hearing, and balance. Okay, each of these different sensor receptors can be classified into one of five or six types. Firstly, we have something called mechanoreceptors. Mechanoreceptors are detecting and transducing a mechanical stimulus. So a touch receptor, a pressure receptor, all those receptors that are found in your skin are primarily mechanoreceptors. On the other hand, we also have chemoreceptors. Chemoreceptors detect chemicals. So where do you have those? Well, in your mouth and also in your nose. So smells or tastes are basically chemicals that are either in the air or the food that you eat that are transduced as smells or tastes respectively. And then we have something called thermoreceptors. Thermoreceptors are detecting temperature. Obviously we have those in our skin, right? If we put our hand under hot water, it tells us, wow, that's really hot, okay? Or if it's too cold, we also have thermoreceptors in our hypothalamus as well. And where do we have photoreceptors? Well, photoreceptors in humans are just found in the eyes, right? In the retina, that's responsible for transducing light. 
And finally, we have something called nociception. Nociception is reception of pain. And nociceptors are found all over the body, although they're more concentrated in some areas than the others. Think about your fingertips versus, let's say, your ear. Have you ever poked yourself on your finger? It hurts a lot. You have a lot more pain receptors and touch receptors there than if you poke yourself in the ear or something like that. So nociceptors are pain receptors, modified free nerve endings, and are designed to detect pain and keep us away from painful stimuli. Okay, now let's take a look at the anatomy of sensory receptors in the general senses. Remember, the general senses are distributed all over the body. So the receptor types fall into one of two categories. Either they're free nerve endings, like we see right here, or they're encapsulated receptors, like we see here. So free nerve endings are found in the skin, and they help to detect things like pain. So our noise receptors are often free nerve endings, as are receptors for tickle and itch. On the other hand, we have encapsulated nerve endings, which help to detect things like pressure. So your pacinium corpuscles in your skin are pressure receptors. All right, this slide just shows some typical receptors found in skin, which is our largest sensory organ. They include the free nerve endings, which detect things like itch, tickle, and even pain. They include our Meissner's corpuscles and our pacinium corpuscles, which are right here. And these are encapsulated nerve endings that help to detect things like pressure. Uh, Meissner's are shallow pressure, Pacinian corpuscles down there are deep pressure. And then we have something called the hair root plexus. The hair root plexus is a structure that detects the vibration of the hair. So if you have an insect that lands on the hairs on your arm or the back of the neck, you have this reflex to just swat it away. And that's because you've activated your hair root plexus. Okay, then we have receptors called muscle spindles and proprioceptors. So these are structures that are located in muscles and in joint capsules, uh, and they're important in the sense of proprioception. So proprioception is a sense you probably aren't aware of. Uh, proprioception is the ability to know where your arms and legs and your joints are, even though you're not looking at them. So think about the field sobriety test you see on TV, where they have somebody close their eyes and touch their nose like that. Okay, so how can I do that if my eyes aren't open? Well, you just know where your joints are because you have special stretch receptors in the joints and the muscles that are telling your cerebellum and your brain the approximate location of your arm, etc. Of course, when you become inebriated, that coordination goes out the window. So the big picture here is the sense of proprioception allows your brain to know the approximate location of your appendages uh, without actually having to look at them. Okay, now we're gonna talk about something kind of cool and weird called receptor adaptation. So receptor adaptation is a type of filtering the body does at the receptor level. There's a lot of stimulus that's constant in your body and your body wants to filter that constant stimulus so it can focus on stimulus that's changing. For example, right now I can hear the air conditioner running in the back of the room and if that's running all the time, my body kind of filters it out, but that's not really adaptation. Adaptation is where your body actually stops sending sensory signals up to your brain. For example, take a look if you're wearing a watch. I know most millennials don't wear watches now, but you're probably not aware that it's on your body at all times unless you move it around or you know the watch band breaks and it falls off. So basically the sensory receptors in your skin who have been telling your brain, you're wearing a watch, you're wearing a watch, you're wearing a watch, they eventually just say, nah, forget that, and they stop reporting in. So we have some senses that adapt very quickly. For example, the sense of smell. When you walk in a room and somebody's wearing a weird cologne or something like that, initially you might find it kind of startling, but after a few minutes, you're no longer aware that it's there. So senses like uh, touch and pressure, they adapt very quickly. Senses like pain do not usually adapt. Now the reason pain doesn't adapt because it's there as a protective function. Pain is telling you don't use that joint or don't use that arm, it's injured, let it heal and it wouldn't be productive if we just stopped reporting those pain signals because then we'd start using that arm again. Okay, then there's a phenomenon called referred pain. We said before that nociception were the receptors that detect pain, but referred pain is basically confusion about the origin of pain, and it mainly deals with pain originating from the abdominal cavity or our body organs. And what happens is that some of these uh, nerve pathways that are used on the inside of the body uh, aren't mapped out in the brain on the same way as your skin receptors are, and so sometimes there's some confusion about the origin or location of that pain. So this slide just shows a map of the various pain fields for the different internal organs in the body. So first, let's take a look at the pain field for the heart. The heart is here in blue, and everything that's in blue could be indicating uh, pain from the heart. So if you have pain up here in your chest or pain down in your arm, if you're a guy, that could indicate you're having a heart attack. Now let's look at the pain field for the esophagus. That's in yellow. So the area where it's green right there is the area where those two overlap. 
So you could wake up one night when you're older and say, oh my gosh, I'm having chest pain. I wonder if I'm having a heart attack, but it might just be indigestion from that pizza that you ate, right? Something that's going on in the esophagus. So this is called referred pain because we can't really tell where it's uh, coming from. Okay, now we're gonna go on and talk about the special senses. Now remember the special senses were located in the head, they're cephalized and they include things like taste, smell, vision, hearing, and balance. Okay, now we're gonna move on to talk about the senses of taste and smell. So both the sense of taste and smell utilize chemoreceptors. And remember, chemoreceptors are detecting chemicals. For example, the food that you eat contains chemicals that can be transduced in a pattern of nerve impulses. And you might say, well, I don't eat foods that have chemicals. Well, sure you do. An apple has chemicals in it. Uh, it has glucose. It has all kinds of different carbohydrate compounds. So even though it's a naturally occurring uh, piece of food, it still has chemicals in it. So your mouth can detect chemicals using your taste buds. Uh, and of course, your sense of smell utilizes chemoreception as well. The molecules that you're breathing in and the air become dissolved in the mucus within your mucous membranes and then can be transduced as odorant molecules. Okay, let's take a look at the tongue because it is a sensory organ, but it's also a motor organ. Uh, what is the tongue used for? Well, firstly, it's used for speech, right? To be able to speak correctly. Uh, it's also used for swallowing. It allows us to push food back in the pharynx so it can be swallowed. So we'll talk about that when we get to the digestive system. And of course, we also have these papilla or bumps on there. And some of these bumps are associated with taste buds, which help us to transduce the sense of taste. So here you can see one of these papilla on the left-hand side. And if we look at the side of that papilla, we would have these little bitty crypts in there called taste buds. And the taste buds are connected to the outside in here through something called a taste pore. Now, the taste buds are basically immersed in a moat of saliva right there that is helping to dissolve the taste molecules. That is the molecules that are in your food. Now the physiology of gustation or taste is a little bit complex, so we're not gonna go into all the different details here, but I do wanna point out some different cells there. Okay, so here we have our taste bud, which is located in our papilla. Now along that taste bud, we have some sensory receptor cells that have these sensory hairs on here. We also have cells that are called basal cells. Now basal cells are there to replace your sensory receptors if they're damaged. You might say, well, when is your sensory receptors damaged? Think about eating hot pizza and you bite in that and that molten like red sauce comes out and it burns your taste buds. So if those taste buds weren't able to be repaired, you would very quickly lose your sense of taste as a result of eating too much pizza. So we are able to repair the damaged taste buds to some extent. Okay, we also have epithelial or supporting cells in there as well. But the point is we have a sensory receptor which will transduce uh, the fact that we're binding to these taste molecules and it will transduce that into a graded potential and eventually that becomes an action potential that travels along a sensory neuron and goes to the brain. Okay, now let's talk about some gustatory sensations. You've probably heard before that there are five different types of taste, right? Sweet, sour, salty, umami, and bitter. So why is your brain or why is your sensory system uh, evolved to detect these stimuli? Let's talk about why. Well, why would it be advantageous for you to detect sweet things like uh, sweet things in candy or stuff like that? Well, that tells your brain that there's sugar in there and sugar equals easy energy. So we're evolved to like sweet things, right? Children love sweet things. Okay, what about sour? Well, sour can tell us a few things, but it does tell us uh, about foods that can potentially be higher in vitamin C. They tell us about the acidity, but a lot of the acid foods like uh, citrus fruits have a lot of vitamin C. So that's actually something we want to seek out so that we don't get vitamin C deficiency. And now, what about bitter? I don't have bitter up here, but do we like bitter foods? Well, we come to like bitter foods as we grow older, but as a young person, we probably don't. Uh, a baby or something like that tends to uh, eschew bitter foods. And the reason is that bitterness tells us about plant alkaloids that can be potentially toxic or poisonous. So if you wanna think about what bitter tastes like, chew on an aspirin, that's bitter. Okay, now what about salty? Do we like salty foods? Yes, we love salty foods, right? We love salty foods, we crave salt, and that's because we evolved at a time when salt was a little bit scarce. There wasn't a lot of salt available in our diets, so if we found salt, mmm, salt good, we wanna eat salt. The problem is that our tastes evolve at a much different time than now, and our sort of evolution of taste hasn't caught up. Now we eat food that is way too salty, and that's bad for us, causes heart, heart disease and things like that. Okay, now let's talk about the last taste here, which is something called umami. The other word for umami is savory. It was named by the Japanese, and basically it's a taste that is detecting meaty things. We're detecting things like amino acids, so meat has a lot of umami taste in there, uh, as does soy sauce and sometimes fermented vegetables. Now, there's probably a taste up there that you're saying, hey, what about spicy? That's a taste, I don't see it on there. 
Well, spicy is not technically a taste. It's not detected uh, directly by our taste receptors. Now, oftentimes, uh, spicy is associated probably with some salty, maybe with some umami. But the third thing in there that we're detecting is pain. We actually have nociceptors or pain receptors on your tongue that help to detect that painful stimuli from basically these compounds that are causing pain on your tongue. So if you like spicy foods, you're a bit of a masochist, aren't you? Okay, now let's talk about olfaction. Olfaction is just our sense of smell. And again, it's another type of chemoreceptive sense. And so let's take a look at our olfactory epithelium right here. And up here is our olfactory nerve. So in the olfactory epithelium, what do we have in here? We have some glands that are secreting mucus. We have down here our supporting cells. And then we have our olfactory receptor cells. These are the cells that are gonna transduce that uh, smell molecules into a pattern of nerve impulses or graded potentials in this case. And then we have actually sensory neurons up here in our olfactory bulb. We also have basal cells in there, if you can see it, right? So we can repair damaged sensory receptors. Now, when do we damage our smell receptors? Well, I had a family friend once that was checking uh, the bleach, the powdered bleach or powdered uh, chlorine they had for the pool, and they thought it might be bad, it was old. She went to sniff it, and it actually went up in her nasal cavity. Uh, she had to go to the hospital, but the point was, eventually, she did grow back some of those sensory receptors. She didn't completely lose her sense of smell. We are able to repair it to some degree. Okay, now we'll talk about some peculiar things about olfaction. So as you know, a lot of senses tend to decrease in acuity as we get older, and the sense of smell is definitely one of those. So as we get older, our sense of smell tends to decrease, and as a result, you probably have a grandmother or somebody like that that likes to wear perfume and probably wears a little too much perfume, and the reason is she can't really smell it on herself until she adds a lot there. The other thing about olfaction or sense of smell is it does adapt, right? If you come into a really foul smelling smell, eventually you adapt to it actually pretty quickly. So you wonder like, how can garbage men do the job that they do being around those smelly smells all day long? Well, their body adapts to it. They become accustomed to it. They don't notice so much. This is also the case with body odor, at least your own body odor. Uh, you don't adapt to others' body odor very quickly, unfortunately. Now, a lot of people lose their sense of smell uh, for different reasons. We'll talk about anosmia here in a minute, but humans actually have a pretty crappy ability to detect smells in comparison to things like dogs. Dogs have a tremendous sense of smell, but still, that being said, we can detect some 10,000 different smells, and each of these smells involves a specific set of chemicals that are causing a pattern of nerve impulses that are then interpreted by our brain as a certain type of smell. Okay, now we're gonna briefly go through the process through which olfaction occurs. So the physiology of olfaction. I'm not gonna hold you responsible for all these steps on an exam, but I do want you to see sort of the pattern of things that go on. First of all, we have our smell molecules coming in here. Let's say these are chocolate chip cookie molecules. Your mom's cooking chocolate chip cookies. Mmm, you breathe that air in. Bam, those molecules bind to the epithelium. Uh, before they bind to the epithelium, they're actually gonna dissolve in the mucus in here. So the mucus is nice and moist, and then we bind to the olfactory hairs. And the olfactory hairs are on our receptor cells, and the receptor cells will transduce that into a pattern of graded potentials, and then eventually action potentials that travel up to our olfactory bulb. The action potentials then uh, are propagated from our olfactory bulb up into our brain, where the brain will interpret that pattern of nerve impulses and say, mmm, that smells like cookies. All right, now we're gonna talk about a disorder of the olfactory system called anosmia. Anosmia is the loss of the sense of smell. We can also have a reduced sense of smell called hyposmia. Now, what we found out recently is that people infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus actually have a 40 to 70% chance likelihood of experiencing anosmia or hyposmia as a result of their infection. Now, there's a lot of different viruses and even medications that can cause reduced sense of smell, but in many cases, we found out that these viruses or medications actually attack the nerve cells of the receptors that are involved uh, in olfaction. However, it seems to be with the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus that it's not actually attacking those cells, but it's actually attacking the epithelial cells, supporting cells associated with the olfactory epithelium. So the good news about this is even though a large proportion of people with the virus will have lack of smell, eventually they should get that back. All right, now we're gonna go on and talk about sound reception or the sense of hearing. Now, sound is actually pressure waves generated when something makes a sound and they pass through the air. So the receptors that are gonna detect those sound waves are actually gonna be mechanoreceptors. And we'll show you those in a few slides. But let's look at the external anatomy of the ear and talk about what each of these structures does. Okay, so on the left-hand side here, we have something called the oracle. The oracle is just a funny name that means earlobe. Now, what do you think the purpose of the oracle is? Well, if you look at it, it's kind of like a funnel, and the oracle's job is to funnel sound waves into the external auditory canal, which is right here. 
So when those sound waves are funneled into the external auditory canal, they then bounce against something called the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane is the junction between the external ear and what we call the middle ear, which is right here. So it's like a big drum head, and as sound waves vibrate that drum head, they push on these ossicles that we'll show in just a second, and those ossicles push on a structure in the inner ear called the cochlea. And the cochlea is a structure where the actual transduction occurs, and we're going to show that in the next few slides. Okay, this picture just shows an expanded view of the middle ear and the internal ear. So what we can see here is our tympanic membrane. Remember, as sound waves uh, came through the external ear, they vibrate the tympanic membrane. Now, the vibrations of the tympanic membrane are passed along these three inner ear ossicles called the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And the stapes is pushing on this structure here called the oval window, which is the first part of our cochlea, and we'll show that in just a minute. Now, while we're here, I want to point out this structure right here called the eustachian tube. The eustachian tube is a very important structure because it helps to equilibrate the pressure in the middle ear. So think about when you're driving over the poly or something like that and you feel your ears begin to feel pressure and they begin to pop. You might do a chewing motion or something like that. What's happening there is the pressure in the middle ear is beginning to expand or increase as a result of reduced atmospheric pressure. So the air in there in your middle ear, you got down at normal sea level, and as you drive up, that air expands and causes pressure, and eventually that excess pressure needs to escape through the station tube, otherwise it could perforate our tympanic membrane. All right, so again, our tympanic membrane vibrates. It passes those vibrations along the incus, the malleus, and the stapes. And the stapes is pushing on this oval window, which is the sort of entryway into our cochlea right here. Now, it's important to realize that the cochlea itself is fluid filled. And so any vibrations we're putting in there, it's not really compressible. So if we push in, we need an equally push out. And that occurs right here at our round window. When we push in with our stapes, the round window is going to bulge outward to relieve that pressure. All right, now we're going to go through the physiology of hearing, and it's a very complicated process. I'm not holding you to all the steps, but I do want to show you basically how it works. So all the numbered steps you can see in the back of me uh, correlate to the next two or three slides and the numbers that are on the anatomy there. So if you ever have any questions, go back to your PowerPoint, look at the number there. It'll tell you what's going on. Okay, so let's start with step number one. Sound waves are coming in towards your ear. They're being funneled by that external ear, right? This part called the pinna. And the pinna or auricle is uh, focusing this sound into the external auditory canal. Number two then, that sound waves then vibrates our tympanic membrane or eardrum. And that tympanic membrane also passes those vibrations along our middle ear ossicles, which were our malleus, incus, and stapes. So all three of those are vibrating. And step number four over here is that our uh, stapes is pushing on our oval window. Now remember the oval window is the entryway into the cochlea and the cochlea is a fluid filled organ. So as the stapes is vibrating, it's passing these vibrations along the fluid filled cavities of our cochlea right here. And the topmost cavity is called the scala vestibuli. And eventually those vibrations move along the bottommost cavity which is called the scala tympani. Now, in the process, they're going to be pressing upon this next canal, our basilar membrane, which is going to be forcing something called hair cells into a tectorial membrane. And this is where the process of transduction is going to occur. All right, so those pressure waves that were created when the stapes was pressing on the oval window uh, set up a pressure moving through the fluid-filled cavity that is the scala tympani and scala vestibuli. Big picture is the cochlea is fluid-filled. As we press on that, we're then going to cause bulging somewhere in the organ. And this is the scale of vestibuli right here, the bottommost cavity, and lying on it is something called the basilar membrane. Well, sitting on the basilar membrane are our hair cells. The hair cells are the cells that transduce sound. These are mechanoreceptors that are basically just sitting there, and above them is a diving board-like organ called the tectorial membrane. And so what happens is as sound is passed along uh, through the cochlea, it causes vibration of this membrane, and when this membrane vibrates, it will smash our, um, our hair cells up into the tectorial membrane, and when that happens, they will transduce those vibrations uh, as a graded potential and eventually action potentials, and those action potentials travel to the brain where they are interpreted in our temporal lobe as sound. So big picture here is that the organs or the cells that do the transduction of sound are, are actually hair cells and they're a type of mechanoreceptors. So every time that hair cell encounters that tectorial membrane, we form an action potential that goes to the brain. 
Now, I should point out that these hair cells uh, are not replaceable. They're not like the chemoreceptors that we have in our mouth and also uh, in our nasal cavities that can be replaced. Uh, these cells, once they're damaged, aren't replaced. So if you have really loud music, it's smashing those hair cells a lot in that tectorial membrane. They lose their hairs and you eventually lose a part of your sense of, of hearing. And that happens as we get older, right? Our sense of hearing goes away, particularly if you listen to a lot of loud music. Okay, now we're going to go on to the sense of vision. Now, the sense of vision is a dominant sense. Uh, we said initially that the sense of vision was initially interpreted back here in our occipital lobe, but there's a lot more parts of the brain that are involved in actually analyzing what's going on uh, with visual input. So we are very visual animals, not so much olfactory. So about a half of the cerebral cortex is involved in some way in vision or visual image recognition. All right, now we're gonna go through the parts of the eye and talk about what each of them does. In doing this, we're gonna talk about the pathway of light. So light first encounters uh, the eye right here at the cornea. Now the cornea is this clear layer right here, which is over the pupil. Now the cornea is made up of fibrous connective tissue. It's part of the fibrous tunic and it's continuous with the sclera, which is the white of the eye. And one of the functions of the cornea is to refract light. Now refraction here means to bend the light. So it's kind of like a lens. It helps to bend the light to eventually focus it way back here on the macula, which is where we have most of our photoreceptors. All right, so the cornea was right there. It bent the light. We then pass through something called aqueous humor. Now aqueous here means it's liquid humor says liquid, so it's liquid liquid. And the aqueous humor is important for maintaining part of the three-dimensional structure of the eye. Now, if we have too much aqueous humor, as in glaucoma, that can cause problems and even vision loss. All right, so that was our aqueous humor. We then go through the uh, pupil. The pupil is the hole in the iris. What was the iris for? Well, in dim light conditions, your iris opens up, making a big pupil, and in low light conditions, uh, sorry, in high light conditions where it's very bright, the pupil will constrict so you don't have too much light coming to the eye. So we have an iris in your camera, you also have an iris in your eyeball, and the hole in that iris is called the pupil. Okay, the next structure we're going to encounter right here is something called the lens. The lens is sort of a crystalline-like structure, it's really unique, and it's the next structure that's important in bending light. We said before that the cornea refracts light, but so does the lens, but the lens is adjustable. So the lens can go through the process of bending light and accommodating depending on if you're looking something far away or near. So the lens can be stretched out or it can bunch up depending on whether we're looking at something that's far or, or near. All right, next back here, we have something called the vitreous body. You may not see it here, but it's a big globe of snot looking stuff. And it also helps to hold the eyeball's three dimensional shape because that's important for refraction and, and focusing as well. If you ever take the lab for this class, you actually get to dissect a sheep eye and actually pull this thing out. And literally it looks like one of those little lychee candies. It's very, very gross. Okay, the next layer we have beyond our vitreous humor or vitreous body is something called the retina. And the retina is only a, like a tissue paper thin layer that's almost translucent, but it's a very important layer because this is where our photoreceptors are located. This is where your rods and cones are located, and this is where transduction of light occurs. Light stimuli coming in is transduced into a pattern of nerve impulses. Now back beyond that, there's another layer called the choroid layer. The choroid layer is a dark pigmented layer, and it also has a lot of blood vessels. As it turns out, our sense of vision needs a lot of oxygen. So these blood vessels in here supply the oxygen and nutrients and glucose to the retina of the eye. And finally, coming out of the eye right here, we can see something called the optic nerve. The optic nerve then goes to the, uh, basically the occipital lobe of the brain eventually, where that information is perceived and eventually analyzed. Now, it's important to point out that we don't actually have any photoreceptors right here where our optic nerve exits the eye. We actually have a blind spot. The majority of our photoreceptors are located up here in an area called the macula. And finally, I want to point out one last structure, and this is on the outside of the eye. And the outside of the eye is enclosed with another fibrous connective tissue capsule called the sclera. The sclera is the white part of the eye that goes all the way from here all the way up to the front of the eye where it's connected to the cornea. And the sclera and the cornea together make up the fibrous tunic of the eye. All right, now we're going to look through the microscope at the different cellular layers found within the retina of the eye. Remember, the retina was this tissue paper thin membrane, and it's responsible for transducing the light stimulus into actual patterns of nerve impulses that your brain can understand. So light would be coming in from up here, and within the retina, we encounter the photoreceptor cells right here. So these are the nuclei of the photoreceptor cells. We also have cells in there called ganglion cells and bipolar cells. And eventually, these are going to transduce that information in the light into a pattern of nerve impulses. Now, beyond that, we have something called the pigmented retinal epithelium and also the choroid. 
these areas are very, very black and pigmented. Why is that? Well, this keeps light from bouncing back uh, from the sclera back through the retina a second time. Now, most of you are too young to remember film cameras, but those of us that had film cameras, occasionally you would double expose uh, a certain piece of film to where you got two exposures on it. Light would pass through twice and would result in this distorted image. That's kind of what would happen if we allowed light to bounce back through the sclera, and it's one of the reasons why we have this dark choroid and also the retinal epithelium right here. Now, the sclera back here was fibrous connective tissue. The main function of the sclera is to hold the three-dimensional uh, shape of the eye and keep it round along with the vitreous body and the aqueous humor because if we change the length or diameter of the eyeball, we change where the light is focused on. So within our retina, we have two different types of photoreceptors. We have our rods over here and our cones over here. So rods give us black and white vision, and they're very active. They have a high acuity at low light levels. So in low light levels, your rods are the ones that are primarily transducing the light that's coming in. And so think about what your bedroom looks in a dim environment. If it's 5.30 in the morning, you're looking around, everything's in shades of grays. That's because we're using mostly our rods at this point. The other thing you want to notice is as you're looking around your furniture, your dresser, the edges will be a little bit fuzzy because we don't have the high acuity that we have with our cones. Now the cones on the other hand give us color vision and cones require actually quite a lot of light to work properly and so your cones become active when you turn the lights on or it's light outside, that's when you're using your cone vision. The other thing besides just seeing colors, you'll notice that the edges of objects when they're well lit seem nice and sharp and that's because cones have better acuity at being able to detect edges and things like that. Okay, while we're talking about the retina, I just want to go back and talk about that blind spot I was talking about earlier. So this is what you would see inside the eye if we're looking through an ophthalmoscope. The blind spot right here is where the optic nerve was exiting the eye, and this is a structure called the optic disc. Now, what you want to notice over here is an area called the macula. The macula is a concentration of photoreceptors, uh, mainly cones here, uh, and it's where all our light is going to be focused when we're looking directly at an object. So I'm, if I'm looking directly at an object, that light should be focused on the macula, which is where I have the greatest uh, proportion of photoreceptors. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about visual processing. Now remember that each eyeball is connected to an optic nerve, and what I want you to see here though is that the optic nerve from the right eye is actually crossing over to the left side of the brain. And same here with the optic nerve from the left eye is crossing over to the right brain. So this crossing over point is something called the optic chiasm, and as a result we have most of the information from the left eyeball going to the right brain and vice versa. And so the occipital lobe of the brain is where we uh, process all that information and we have to basically put it together so that the brain understands uh, where the light's coming from and we make the correct decisions based on the sensory information that's coming in. All right, before we wrap up this lecture, I want to talk briefly about binocular vision. Now, like a lot of organs in the body, we have two eyeballs. What's the reason for that? Well, having two is always better than one. If one gets damaged, you got the other one. But let's talk about why our eyeballs are so close together. If we look at our eyeballs, they're pretty close set. If we look at eyeballs of a horse, they're a lot further apart. So having eyeballs that are close together uh, actually wastes a lot of our visual field. We can't see on the sides of our body because a lot of our visual field from the left and right eyes overlap. So why do we do that? Why don't we have eyes that are further apart? Well, as it turns out, having overlapping visual fields is really good for depth perception. And why do we need such good depth perception? Is it for basketball? Is it for football? No. Well, the answer is humans evolved as predator animals. We're designed to have these overlapping visual fields because it gives us better depth perception, and we need that better depth perception for throwing spears and catching animals, right? If you're a predator, you need to be able to catch what you're chasing. And so here are some other examples of predator animals. Cats, dogs, close-set eyes there. Eagles or whatever that is, close-set eyes. Animals that don't have close-set eyes, let's look at a horse. Let's look at a cow. So these are herbivore animals, right? They don't have to ambush their, their feed. They don't have to be like, uh, grass, right? So instead, they're just out there grazing. So what do they gain by having these wide set eyes if it means they don't have depth perception? Well, because they're a herbivore, they don't really need that depth perception. But what they gain here is a wider visual field. They can see further around them, and they can keep an eye out for these guys, the predator animals. So in general, herbivore animals tend to have wider set eyes that gives them a wider field of vision. Predator animals tend to have closer set eyes that allows them greater depth perception and ability to pursue prey. All right, experiment time. We're going to do an experiment to figure out the effects of monocular versus binocular vision on depth perception. Remember, monocular is just using one eye, whereas binocular is using both eyes. So what you need for this experiment is a water bottle and also a thick pen or Sharpie, and you're also going to need a willing participant.
Okay, we have Nyan Stilwell here to demonstrate this experiment that involves depth perception. So I'm going to move this bottle five times, and he's going to try to hit it each time by placing the Sharpie into the bottle very quickly as soon as I stop moving. Okay, so one, hit, two, miss, three, miss, four, hit, five, hit. So three out of five, not bad. Now I would like you to cover one eye, and we're going to try it again. Miss, miss, miss. Miss. <laughs> Miss. Excellent. So now you can see that binocular vision plays a role in depth perception. Okay, after you've conducted this experiment a couple times, you should compare your results. Were they more accurate with both eyes open or with one eye closed? What you probably found out is they're more accurate if they have both eyes open. That way they can have better depth perception in order to hit the target. When we have only one eye, monocular vision, it's a lot harder to hit that target each time. All right, now we're going to talk about how the eyeball focuses on an image. Because just like a camera, we need to adjust our eyeball in order to be able to focus on images that are very close versus images that are further away. And that process is something called accommodation. Accommodation is the adjustment of the lens shape and also the pupil size. And mostly it's lens shape right here. Remember the two parts of the eye that refract light are the lens, but also the cornea. The cornea actually does more refraction than the lens does, but the lens is the adjustable part. So let's look what happens when we're looking at a near object or a far away object. All right, first we're going to talk about how we focus at objects that are far away. So if we're looking at something that's very far away, we need to stretch out that lens to flatten that lens in order to focus that light on the fovea or the macula right there. So the lens has to be stretched out like a pancake. On the other hand, when we're looking at something that's very close to us, that lens needs to take a more globe-like shape in order to be able to focus the same image on the same spot on the fovea or the macula. The big thing here is the lens has to be elastic. We have to be able to stretch it out for far objects and let it globe up for near objects. But as we get older, the elasticity of the lens gets less elastic, so the lens isn't able to snap back to that circular shape. So over 40% of Americans have what we call refractive abnormalities. Their eye is not efficiently able to do the process of accommodation. Uh, and that could be for a couple of reasons. One, we could have an eyeball that's a little bit longer than it should be. Uh, the other reason is maybe the lens isn't quite as elastic as it used to be. So first we're going to look at myopia, which is nearsightedness. And this is a very common visual disorder. Uh, some people have it from birth. A lot of us uh, begin to assume it around 12, 13, thereabouts. It is genetic. And so what happens in a myopic eye is that the light coming in is basically focused too early at a point in front of where the actual macula or fovea would be. And so as a result, by the time it gets to the macula or fovea, the light has become unfocused again. So the solution here is to put a concave lens in front of the eye and therefore uh, have it focused properly on that fovea or the macula. Now on the other hand, hyperopia is the opposite. We're actually focusing the light uh, too late. You can see the focal point in here is actually in back of where the macula or the fovea would be. So remember the macula or fovea is where our photoreceptors are located. So to correct for hyperopia, we actually go up here and we put a convex lens in front and therefore we get the light to focus on the correct area where our photoreceptors are located. Okay, another name for hyperopia is presbyopia. And what does presbyopia mean? It means old people vision. So the next time you're hanging around the house with your extended family, take a look at how your grandfather looks at the phone versus how the grandkids look at the phone. Grandkids can hold the phone very, very close. They can focus on things that are very near to them, whereas your grandfather or grandmother, she might have to hold that phone a little bit further away. And again, this is a result of something called presbyopia. You become farsighted. You can't focus on things that are near because uh, either the eyeball is misshapen, but a lot of times we've lost the elasticity to the lens, so we're not able to focus on near-filled objects without bifocals or something like that. All right, now it's time for another experiment. This experiment, we're going to find out how minimum focal distance changes with age. So what do you need? You need a number two pencil that ideally has some writing at the top surface there. You also need a young person, somebody that's under 18, and an older person, ideally somebody that's over 60. But again, these should be people in your household. And finally, you need a ruler or measuring tape. Okay, for this experiment, you want your assistant to hold a pencil at arm's length away from their body while looking at the words, the brand name that's written at the top of the pencil, there where it says number two. You then want them to bring the pencil closer to their nose until the words begin to blur. At that point, you want to stop and measure the distance between their nose and the pencil, and there you have the minimal focal distance. Now, once you have that distance, you want to come up and measure the distance with a tape measure or a ruler right here, and we can see that's about five or six inches. You want to try that for different subjects in your family, people that are younger, like Nyan, or people that are older. And what we're going to find out is the older people, the pencil will blur further away than for the younger people. 
All right, the last visual defect we want to talk about is something called astigmatism. Astigmatism is caused by having an irregularity in the shape of the lens or one of the other refractive areas of the eye. And chances are you already know if you have astigmatism if you've gone to an optometrist or ophthalmologist, but they have this astigmatism test that you can look at, and if either of these lines in here look a little bit thicker than the other ones, then it could mean you have astigmatism. Just like everything else, we have corrective lenses that can correct for an astigmatism, either using glasses or even contact lenses. All right, you've reached the end of our lecture on the special senses and the sense organs. As always, if you have any questions about particular topics, don't understand them, go back and review that part of the lecture. If you still have questions, send me an email or a text. Good luck.